Uh, on behalf of the faculty, staff, students, alumni, supporters, and friends of Virginia State University, uh, to welcome you uh, to Virginia State University. We are very excited uh, to be able to host the Socially Disadvantaged Producer American Rescue Plan Roundtable and Town Hall. Um, I greet you uh, as the president, the 14th president of Virginia State University, but also uh, as the chair of the 1890 Council of Presidents. Uh, and we are excited as 1890s and excited as Virginia State uh, to be involved in this wonderful program. Uh, we have some wonderful faculty and staff who are here in the, in the building, led by our dean, uh, Dr. M. Ray McKinney, who is here. Raise your hand, sir. Uh, who does a lot of incredible work here at Virginia State University. And I just wanted you to know who I uh, represent. Uh, it is my pleasure uh, to, to give remarks, but also to, to bring up after I finish in order. I'm going to ask you all to, to write this down so you know. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Brad uh, Copenhaver, the commissioner uh, of VDAX, uh, Congresswoman Abigail Spamberger, uh, uh, Secretary uh, Bettina Ring, uh, and of course, uh, the Deputy Secretary of Agriculture, uh, Dr. Jewel uh, Brunner. But before I bring them up, I also want to acknowledge um, all of the, 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 the VIPs, if you will, who are also here, uh, which would include uh, R. Kevin uh, Bahon from FSA and uh, Brenda Ebron Bonner uh, from the Dinwiddie Board of Supervisors. I hope I said that correctly. Okay, whew, that's checking. I don't, I don't want to get them wrong. Uh, and of course, the chair of the Chesterfield County Board of Supervisors, and we in Virginia State are in Chesterfield County, uh, Mr. Jim Holland. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for coming. Uh, and while I've already mentioned, of course, you know that the Deputy Secretary of Agriculture for the USDA is here, I would also like to introduce her, of course, by some of her former titles, um, which would include a graduate of uh, Petersburg High School. Uh, and also uh, the dean uh, here at uh, Virginia State University. It is our great pleasure, our great pleasure, to be able to welcome her back in one of her very first official duties as Deputy Secretary of Agriculture here to Virginia State uh, to announce a program that, 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 that the administration is working on. And so with that, um, I bring forward those individuals in that order uh, to be able to also bring remarks to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, President Abdullah, uh, for, for that introduction. It, uh, my name is Brad Copenhaver, and I am the new commissioner of the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. I am well aware that I have a very tough act to follow. Uh, Secretary Bernal, you have set a tremendous uh, leadership example, and uh, I think my job is just going to be to continue all the good work that, that you and the team at VDAX uh, have been doing for, for the past few years, so thank you. Uh, it is great to be here at Virginia State. Uh, I really have enjoyed working uh, with VSU over the last uh, few years. Uh, I see Beck Stanley uh, in the back of the room uh, with the Virginia Agribusiness Council. Uh, I also uh, used to, to be in Beck's role, and, and during that time, uh, I had the opportunity to work very closely with VSU, so uh, very excited to be back here on campus. Uh, you all do tremendous work. Uh, as the 1890 land-grant university, uh, VSU is just uh, a tremendous resource uh, for Virginia agriculture, and uh, I, I really hope to, to lift up uh, VSU and, and get you all the recognition uh, that you deserve for the good work um, that, that you do. I have had the pleasure over the last year uh, working on uh, cannabis legalization and worked with Michael Carter uh, from the Small Farm Outreach Program on the uh, legalization work group over the last year and worked uh, really closely with him and really <clears throat> enjoyed that relationship. Uh, and now in my new role uh, as the VDAX commissioner, uh, I look forward to getting to know each and every one of you and working with you even more closely. So today, uh, today is my very, <laughs> very first day on the job. Uh, and this is my very first event. Uh, so I'm gonna be in listening mode today. Uh, I'm really excited to, to hear what you have to say and, and to meet with all of you again. Uh, this is such an, an important topic uh, and just can't thank uh, Secretary Bernal, enough uh, for your leadership and, and for, for bringing us all together here today. So thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. I am Abigail Spanberger, and I represent Virginia's seventh district in Congress, and I am delighted to be here on the campus of VSU. So, President Abdullah, thank you so much for welcoming us. I am also so very excited uh, to be welcoming back uh, Deputy Secretary Bernard as uh, she takes on this new incredible role of leadership within the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And it's always great to see Secretary Ring. Uh, we have worked together a significant amount. I uh, represent Virginia's 7th Congressional District in Congress, and that's Culpeper, Orange, Louisa, Goochland, Powhatan, Amelia, Nottoway, half of Spotsylvania County, half of Chesterfield County, and half of Henrico County. So across the districts that I represent, I represent a whole lot of farmers, uh, agricultural land, and, and producers. And it is so incredibly important that I hear the stories directly from those who I represent and also communicate back the things that I've been working on on their behalf. Uh, in the House of Representatives, I serve on the Agriculture Committee. Uh, it was uh, one of my, it was my top choice, that's where I wanted to be, because I wanted to make sure that I would have the ability to bring those who I represent to the literal table um, in the halls of Congress so that we could discuss the issues that mattered to Virginia's farmers and producers and ranchers and foresters, um, and, and also recognize the real challenges that um, our agricultural communities are facing. Uh, I chair the Conservation and Forestry Subcommittee in the House of Representatives. And uh, in that role, I've really been focused on ensuring that as we talk about voluntary conservation programs and how we might implement them or expand them or build upon them, uh, because they benefit our producers, because they're great for output, because they can help reduce costs, because they help us combat climate change, um, recognizing that they also have, at times, really costly points of entry. How can we ensure that those programs are more accessible uh, and more usable? So that's something that I have been focused on. And I'm here today to proudly be a part of this event because I also voted uh, for the American Rescue Plan. I am proud of the support and the relief that it delivers to communities across the country, to individuals struggling with unemployment, to families uh, challenged by school closures, to small business owners struggling to stay afloat, uh, and to our farmer and farming and agricultural communities that have been uh, uniquely impacted. Uh, and specifically today, I am proud of the support that we have brought to black farmers and socially disadvantaged farmers. And so I'm delighted to participate in this program. I am proud of the legislation that we passed. Um, and I am so delighted that you all um, are here to hear a bit more about the implementation once Congress passed it. We pushed it over to the USDA, um, and I'm just so delighted to be here to support um, Sec Deputy Secretary Brunaz's um, uh, event. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here, President Abdullah. Thank you. Always a wonderful, warm welcome here. It's, um, and, and I think our, our new Deputy Secretary said it well this morning about how it feels when you're at VSU and you feel it the minute you drive onto campus or walk onto campus and the minute you walk in and, and sense the community. So thank you uh, for hosting today. And uh, to our new Deputy Secretary, um, Jewel Bernard, Dr. Jewel Bernard. Uh, for really making this possible and for USDA uh, pulling this together. It's a very exciting day and uh, I've had the great pleasure of being able to work with Dr. Brennan in a number of capacities over the years, but most recently as our Ag Commissioner and we're so proud and excited for her and I think you all have um, have, have heard me say that but cannot say enough about the tremendous leadership that she has provided and is only going to continue to provide and um, uh, just just a joy to work with. So happy to be a part of this. And then also our, our new Ag Commissioner, uh, Brad Copenhaver, who was our Deputy Secretary of Agriculture and Forestry in our secretariat. And uh, he's hit the ground running uh, with the best, the best place to start here at VSU on his first day uh, and done a tremendous job uh, and working closely with you all uh, throughout his career. And uh, great to be with our acting FSA director, our great partners, um, and to also NRCS uh, with our state conservationists here with Dr. Martinez. Martinez, um, just tremendous partners. It takes all of us working together to be able to accomplish uh, what we do in agriculture, rural development, all that you do through across USDA and tremendous partners. Uh, our local officials that are here, and our state legislators. But thank you for the relief that you've been providing uh, from the federal level, what's possible, what we've already accomplished together, but also what's to come. 
and there's so much more to come. Uh, we have, and, and unfortunately Governor Northam couldn't be with us today uh, since his regrets, but he is just um, a big ambassador and supporter and friend of VSU and continues um, you know, to work hand in hand with you. We are so proud uh, of the good work that, that he's been doing as well. Um, and I know it's been a challenging year for everyone. It's nice to be at this listening session today. When we first started our administration, our secretariat, uh, from the beginning started holding listening sessions. We did that in partnership with the Black Family Land Trust and with VSU and Extension. And we have Ron Howell here today who uh, was working in our secretariat. Um, uh, at the time he was with USDA and then moved on to VSU. And to be able to have those listening sessions and what we heard at that time was that we need more markets for minority farmers, for our farmers and producers, for the good work that you all are doing to recognize that and do more to expand those markets. We heard that we needed more technical and legal services to address air property issues, and also uh, to make sure that we're planning, that we have that transfer of land. And what's nice today is that we see so many farmers and producers that have the next generation with them. So thank you for bringing your family members, for all that you're doing to help them with continuing that farming. So we then, and those listening sessions actually occurred before we laid out our top three priorities for our secretariat, rural economic development, farmland and forest land retention, making sure we keep land intact, we keep it in forestry and agriculture, in farming, and that we keep it in the family whenever we can, and then addressing food and security. And so all three of those priorities are a result of hearing from you and what we've been able to do together with the great work um, that Jewel did also as Ag Commissioner. We've been able to address Ayers property through the Uniform Partition Act, working with the Black Family Land Trust and our other partners. We've been able to put a food access program in place. We've been working with many of you to roll that out. Um, those grants are out, and uh, we'll be awarding more in the future. Uh, to be able to provide more markets and to address in food insecurity across the state. And thanks to the leadership at the federal level, we've been able, we've had more people that are food insecure than ever, but thanks to leveraging federal and state dollars, we've been able to make sure we're stepping up to ensure the most vulnerable, the socially disadvantaged are fed, that our children are fed, that our seniors are fed, and uh, we've been feeding the world for a long time in the farming community. Thank you all for what you do to not only feed the world, but to feed uh, those in our backyard and across the state. Um, and so those things that we can talk about in more detail, but a lot that we're gonna be doing with the remaining time, the Governor Northam's in office to make sure we're de dealing with generational transfer. So we're proud uh, that the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, the Department of Forestry are working on Generation Next and they're doing more in partnership. We're proud of the great work and we have some of our VDACs um, board members here. Thank you for your leadership and guidance as we um, chart that course together. Just again, a great pleasure to be here. We look forward to listening and learning um, and, and our new commissioner and I will be working to make sure we're doing all we can at the state level to take what we hear from you today, working with our great partners um, in DC, uh, our friends and um, uh, the tremendous leadership that we have there. So uh, thank you again. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out today. Uh, when I was a dean, I would always say it's a great day to be at Virginia State University. So I'm going to say that again. It's, it's a great day to be at Virginia State University. Um, I, I certainly would like to, to thank the folks who joined me at the head of the room, Congresswoman Spanberger. We always appreciate your advocacy and su support you speak very loudly and clearly on behalf of agriculture and forestry in Virginia. Secretary Ring is, is someone who is uh, a person I had the fortunate opportunity to work with, but she's also a, a mentor and a friend. I've learned a great deal from Secretary Ring, mostly in uh, the way that she treats people. It's very kindly, but she's also very effectively. I was fortunate enough to work with, with Kevin Bohan at FSA. He is the acting state executive director Glad to see you, Kevin. And of course, the first day on the job to Commissioner Copenhaver. Brad, you're going to do a fabulous job. He was a fabulous uh, deputy secretary and is going to be an excellent commissioner. But thank all of you all for taking the time to join today. I am joined by my chief of staff, who I'm always very proud to introduce. She's in the back of the room, 
Miss Yang, Miss e. Yang Garrison. She's she is one of the most brilliant young women I've had the opportunity to meet and work with, and I'm proud to work alongside her. Um, I just appreciate President Abdullah, your support for allowing us to have this event here at Virginia State. And uh, I say that Virginia State is the, the first place to give me an opportunity. Um, I, I started here as an extension specialist in, in 4-H, and Virginia State trusted me enough to allow me to advance up through the university. Dean McKinney is now the dean doing an excellent job. But I, I just thank VSU and all the shoulders, the people in this room who pushed me forward and allowed me to stand on your shoulders to get to where I am today. And I've been fortunate enough to work with so many uh, of farmers and ranchers and forest land owners in this room. But today is uh, about an effort to provide resources to producers in this room who have fought and struggled for what, have should, uh, what should have been provided many years ago. Um, it is with great honor that I make this uh, announcement about debt relief for farmers of color, BIPOC farmers, or socially disadvantaged farmers. And for much of the history of USDA, socially disadvantaged producers have faced discrimination. Sometimes it's been overt, but it has also been deeply embedded in the rules and the policies that have prevented socially disadvantaged farmers from achieving as much as their counterparts who have not faced the same documented acts of discrimination. And then you layer the COVID-19 pandemic, which demonstrated disparities that also exist among socially disadvantaged producers who have faced decades of discrimination as opposed to those who've had advantages. So the American Rescue Plan seeks to address those cumulative effects of discrimination amongst socially disadvantaged producers with a program of debt relief and long-term racial equity work. And we know that there are individual acts of discrimination. We, we talked about this in the, the, the round table. There are those individual acts of discrimination that have had negative impacts. But there are cumulative effects of systemic racism that have been in USDA's policies regulations and programs that have created a situation where socially, uh, socially disadvantaged farmers have lost. They've, they've lost. They've gone backwards. The resources provided to USDA for this debt relief is just one small step that we hope that USDA can do to help socially disadvantaged farmers begin to move forward. We acknowledge there's a lot more work to be done, but this is just the start. So through the debt relief program, USDA is focused on carrying out loan payments in a responsible and expeditious manner and begin a new era of trust with USDA and socially disadvantaged producers. In our round table, the farmers who spoke said, you know, there's a lot of apprehension about this. Of course there is, because the challenges, the discrimination, and the effects of that have gone on for years. And it is going to take years to come out of that. We recognize that. So I'm excited to talk about what we have available. And I'll share a little bit of the details. And I think we may be able to answer a couple of questions. Uh, we do have some resources provided that will be helpful. Um, and, and just glad to be here today. So. What does this American Rescue Plan debt relief program do? It allows the USDA to pay up to 120% of loan balances as of January 1st, 2021 for FSA direct and guaranteed loans and farm storage facility loans. The direct loans uh, will cover the ownership loans, operating loans. Um, also, there are micro loans, there's some youth loans in there, um, conservation loans, soil and water loans, and a few others. The 120% payment represents the full cost of the loan to include that 100% towards the loan balance as of January 1st, 2021, and an additional 20% reimbursement for tax liabilities 
and any and all other fees associated with the debt. So any payments by borrowers made since January 1st will be reimbursed in full in addition to the total loan amount. So how does this uh, American Rescue Plan determine who qualifies? It is based on race and ethnicity, specifically as defined by the Section 2501 of the Food, Agriculture, Conservation, and Trade Act of 1990. Congress was very specific in outlining the socially disadvantaged farmers based on race and ethnicity. So farmers of black and African-American descent, American Indian, Alaskan Native, Hispanic, Latino, Asian American, or Pacific Islander qualify. Any socially disadvantaged borrower with a qualifying loan is eligible for loan repayment. And so USDA is now moving into the payment phase. We will begin with the direct loan borrowers first and will soon reach the guaranteed loan borrowers later this summer. So what happens next? We've already, on Monday, released a, a notice of funding. And there are people like myself at USDA who are going about the country to make these similar announcements. Secretary Vilsack was in Georgia over the weekend. Um, he was in South Carolina the uh, day before yesterday. And having these same messages, we want to share this message so that we have voices like those who are in the room who can also share the message, because this is gonna take an effort beyond just me, an individual person going around, but you all carrying the message forward, answering questions, and saying, hey, here's what you need to do to get the debt repaid. So, we're beginning to send out letters to borrowers. Those letters should begin arriving in early June. All farmers with a qualifying direct loan or debt will receive that letter in the mail confirming that balance as of January 1st, 2021, and asking if any payments have been made since January. If payments have been made, the borrower will be compensated in full. The borrower needs to respond by signing the letter and returning it to USDA. And I wanna say this, this is only a program available through USDA. You know, there's always someone who wants to jump on a bandwagon and say that if you give me $150, I can get your payment process faster. Do not listen to that. This is only a USDA program. Once that letter is returned and verified, the payment process will begin. The payment to the borrowers is 120%, so they will first receive a, that 20% direct deposit directly to the farmer to cover tax liabilities and fees associated with the debt. So once we get your letter, it will trigger that 20% payment to cover tax liabilities and any fees associated with the early payment of that debt. Again, it will come through a direct deposit or if uh, there's no bank account, then a check will be uh, provided to cover that 20%. Within the next four to six weeks, the debt will be repaid 100%. So this process, once you receive the letter, you return the letter to confirm the debt amount, you'll next in a couple of weeks receive the 20% payment to cover taxes and fees. About four to six weeks later, the debt will be repaid. The, again, the payment will begin in June. They're gonna continue on a rolling basis. There's no beginning or end, well, there's a beginning date, but there's no end date. You, this is gonna continue throughout 2021. I don't know if there are any folks in the room who received a letter from USDA asking you to confirm your demographics. That's where you can, deter, you know, can talk about your ethnicity, you can confirm that. You may have received that letter. If you have not, there will be any opportunity, if you've not done so, to be able to confirm your race and ethnicity at any time going forward. So don't think it's been too late for that. 
Um, USDA has really been committed to equity, justice, and equal opportunity mo moving forward. Um, that is what we will do. And we're very fortunate to also, through the American Rescue Plan, receive additional money outside of the debt relief. One, to establish an equity commission. That equity commission is going to consist of farmers and ranchers and forest landowners and other members to make sure that USDA does what we say that we're going to do, to hold us accountable, to make sure that through our policies and our guidelines going forward, that we do not continue acts of discrimination, that we carry out these programs as designated by Congress specifically. There's also money in the American Rescue Plan for outreach and technical assistance. That's really important. We talked earlier today about programs like Virginia State University Small Farm Outreach Program. Those are trusted faces that when those agents come out and they talk to you about how do you apply for the debt relief, what are the details, people trust these individuals because they have good information. They trust the 1890 land grant universities to provide that good information. So there's funding for outreach and technical assistance to make sure people have questions answered. They're able to apply and they understand the process for applying for the resources. There's also funding uh, to address heirs' property issues. Secretary Ring has often talks about the work that has been done in Virginia, Congresswoman Spanberger around heirs' property and the loss of land, which we know that African Americans have been affected the most by heirs' property and land loss. There's funding to uh, develop a loan program um, to cover the cost that it takes to clear the title of that land and make sure that it is not lost. There's also funding that comes to the 1890 land grant institutions to continue the work that it does. So what we have not done with the debt relief, we have additional funding. There is also additional funding for resources uh, and funding to continue to, to support socially disadvantaged farmers after this debt relief occurs. So there's more to come on that end, but I say that to say that it doesn't just stop with the debt relief. We have other opportunities now uh, because uh, what Congress has provided to USDA to continue to support and help going forward. And ultimately, and this is gonna take some time, we really hope to build the trust with socially disadvantaged farmers in hopes that in the future, you can come to USDA seeking assistance. You can trust that we're going to provide that assistance in a fair and equitable way. And that there's a feeling of assurance that we are indeed here to serve and do the right thing. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity. I often get asked, you know, you're uh, the first African-American female in this role. And, and that carries a, a, a lot of not wait, but I understand the significance and the responsibility of that and what that means to people. Um, I have a lot of conversations with Secretary Vilsack, and he has done nothing but ensured that we do the right thing in addressing these issues of racial equity. And we will continue. That is the message that we carry forward in USDA. And with a lot of work to do, and we recognize that there is, we will continue forward, but we hope that this will be our first opportunity to begin the process of dealing with systemic and the cumulative effects of systemic racism that has occurred as a result of actions through USDA going forward. So I thank you all for being here today. We need you to be a voice. We need you to carry this information forward. Um, again, we can't do this without you, but I just appreciate everyone taking time to be here today. And I would certainly, I know we only have an opportunity for maybe one or two questions, but I'm happy to answer questions. If you, if you have a question, we have some resources. I know, I, I think there's a one pager that if it's not available, it will be coming around that kind of summarize. Some people have it in their hands. That's very good. And also, if you have any other questions, there's an FAQ. If you uh, Google farmers.gov, it provides an FAQ to answer additional questions. Farmers.gov for any other questions that you have. 
And we also have uh, outreach and technical assistance through the FSA office. I see Diane Lenore Giles here who can answer specific questions about the process through FSA. So thank you all so much. Uh, it's just an honor to, this is my first official visit out. So it's at Virginia State, I couldn't be more proud. Thank you all very much. make a comment, Madam yes, Secretary. Uh, I am James M. Jim Holland, Chairman of the Chesterfield County Board of Supervisors. We are in the wonderful county of Chesterfield, one of the largest counties uh, in the state of Virginia. I first want to thank you so much for your leadership at uh, USDA and thank our Congressperson as well and all the state officials for being here. I applaud you for your efforts and I will also offer local government as an opportunity through our farm bureaus to also reach out and share information as needed. Uh, I certainly pledge Chesterfield County as chairman to do so and to lead other counties hopefully in helping to reach, to communicate which will be a critical issue and make sure people are informed and not misinformed as you so well stated. But I thank you so very much for your efforts and your leadership today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Oh, Hollins. And one last comment I'll make, hopefully, as you mentioned, and I really appreciate your comment about future efforts that we'll have the infrastructure in place to make sure that people are there to, to answer questions, to help with information as relates to the critical issues of ownership, taxes, and the like, because that's a critical issue with taxation, how it will be handled in farms and all. And when my pastor always said to us, he always says, don't sell the farm, keep the farm. And so we've done that at my farm in Gates, North Carolina. My family still owns it. Uh, it was air property to my father. And of course, my brothers and sisters will never sell it uh, on this good earth. And so uh, we plan to keep that farm and keep it operational for future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holland. I appreciate that. Uh, in our, in our um, smaller round table, I think uh, Mr. Cecil Shell asked a question about um, you know, a lot of people don't, uh, some people don't have, of course, we're trying to expand broadband access across the state for people who don't, you know, have access to a computer. Will there be opportunities to receive information on paper? I love, I love paper. Um, I, I think it's because I can see the writing better on paper. But Mr. Holland talked about, you know, partnerships maybe with localities sometimes to print that information and, and certainly at USDA will look at any and all opportunities to provide printed materials, um, not just electronic materials, but we'll also need some partnership um, with uh, folks like VSU in the, in the localities to be able to print that and get that information out to people who cannot or do not have access to a computer. Yes, Dr. Jewell. And um, Secretary Ring, I didn't recognize you, I'm sorry. Leroy Hardy, Hardy Family Farm, Southampton County, Virginia. I'm the fourth generation of a fifth generation operating and owned farm. I'm a council member of Nottoway Indian Tribe of Virginia. I hate this map, excuse me. My question is, Secretary Vilsack unveiled the microloan program up at the uh, headquarters for were you able to pull, pull? the insurance company of Richmond. I was there. I later applied and got it for a microloan for $30,000. Subsequently, the person that wrote that loan is actually in this room. I, due to no fault of my own, injured my back and I was not able to do the things as I projected. My loan in 2019 was written off with a balance of $12,000. Tax year 2020, if I recall correctly, I received a document from the FSA that they had sent to the IRS saying that I owed taxes on that $12,000. Will I get any help out of what you have proposed and presented here today? to cover that tax liability, 2019-2020. Okay, and great question. And uh, Mr. Hardy, you know, I always appreciate you, representation of our Native American farmers, and thank you for that question. And I may not have the exact question, but do you still owe any current debt? Okay, I, I'm not sure about the specific answer to that question. It gets a little bit down in, into the weeds, and so I will 
make sure that I can follow up. I'll have my uh, chief of staff, Ms. Garrison, get your information so that we can find out about the tax liability. Thank you. Hi, um, Jewel. My name is Tamika from the Progress Index. I have a question. Um, so I noticed that two um, courts, one in Texas, one in Wisconsin, I believe, filed a suit against the loans because you were, you were discriminating against um, white farmers. What are your thoughts on those two lawsuits? Um, so I can, can tell you how we're proceeding. Um, we're very much aware. We um, already have the Department of Justice has been referred and will represent us um, in those lawsuits. But I will tell you with 100% assurity that USDA is going to move forward as we've been designated by Congress. We will move forward with this uh, debt relief program as designated and those suits will, will not have any impact on how we move forward. WBTF. Uh, it's a public great time on your question. Thank you. Uh, thanks for taking our questions. Uh, we're a public radio affiliate here in Virginia. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, land that uh, has already been foreclosed on and what kind of things uh, the, the ARPA has for for those producers and farmers and um, or if like there's kind of things in the in the uh, plans for the USDA to be working on those issues as well. Sure. So uh, yes, the debt relief that's in foreclosure does qualify. Um, things in collections, if there, if there are any accounts, I'm sorry. The, I'm sorry, the foreclose, yeah, foreclosures qualify. Okay. Yes, now the process for dealing with the foreclosures will be a little bit different. Um, it will require some additional assistance as we work through uh, the FSA outreach. They can provide guidance to farms that are in foreclosure, but they do qualify. Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Zachary Morse. I'm from Nelson County, Virginia. Uh, I'm from out there. I'm from the Cattle Farm there. As a matter of fact, we just got a USDA loan to buy our purse to hunt the devil acres back in the Um I've been an advocate for over 30 years for farmland preservation. Um, I wrote a letter to the USDA back in 2000. And uh, somehow I got to the uh, Heritage Foundation. I got an invitation to the White House. I had dinner with Secretary Van Glick. Um, one response that I got back from you know, about preserving all African American farmland was, OK, it's, it's too demonstrative. Uh, it was too, um, uh, the word is, I'm going to say is, um, we, 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 it would be demonstrated, discriminating against all other farmers. Um, I had a privilege to uh, work for United Policy Service up in the western part of Maryland, which is close to Pennsylvania and the state of Maryland. Um, they had the best role models, Pennsylvania and Maryland, farmland preservation. They get up close to ten thousand dollars per acre to preserve their farmland. Um, state of Virginia, you gotta tighten up on the farmland preservation here because that is an economic tool to help us to be more viable in the farm. Um, like I said, I spend most of my, my life as a farmer. Uh, even I worked in Hagestown, Maryland with my farms in Nelson County. I drove three and a half hours every Saturday. I spent vacation in the hayfield cutting timber. Almost died cutting timber. 33 states on top of my head. But the next day, after I left the University of Virginia, I was back in the mountain cutting timber trying to pay for a farm that was on the finance. It got thrown up. Oh, it's actually something to EVA. But anyway, he was nice enough to, he was on the finance, but the, the Payment was just so stiff, it was $17,000 a year. And we were doing everything. My brother had a home to pay for it, I had a home to pay for it. And beef cattle was like 40 cents a pound, 30 cents a pound. Uh, when I first got out of high school, I didn't know what I, what I wanted to do. It was all Central Virginia basketball. I got a scholarship to go to college. But I stayed home for a whole year and I went to work for a white farmer by the name of Dale Harvey in Nelson County. 
three thousand acres land, five hundred head of cattle. We start at seven thirty in the morning. Sometimes we can get off at two o'clock the next morning. If a cow lose a calf, we'll go to Stockton, Virginia, and buy a calf, and put on that calf. Seven days a week, he paid me $130. But it wasn't what he paid me, it was what he taught me. And one of the things he always taught me was, son, by God, I could give you this farm, livestock and barrel, but it'd still be tough for you to pay for it. And he was right. And still today, my youngest brother, Darrell, he works a full-time job as a landscaping company, plus a farmer. The same with me. I work a full-time job, I'm retired now, and I did landscaping plus farming. It's tough to make it. We need every economic advance that we can get, and farmland preservation is the key to our success, along with agritourism, which is not promoted enough for minority farmers. Um, in Nelson County, Virginia, we have what's called the uh, uh, 151 tour of all the um, vineyards, distilleries, and stuff like that. That's where the cash comes in to help farmers to survive. If we can get um, more into the agritourism industry, I think we, we, can be, we, can, we can stand a chance. But there should be grants out there toward that. Um, I, I, I see some of the grants that are being passed out, but they're not helping us to gain land. We need, we need, we need access to land. That's, and we, we, we talk about uh, racial equity. Mm -hmm. That's what we need. We need the opportunity. And you, know, you guys need to come with, with the grants to help us purchase land. Um, all my life, I never asked somebody to give me nothing but opportunity. Amen. You, you can ask anybody who knows me and my family. Amen. We work hard. I mean, from day one, 14 years old, we went to Connecticut, working to the backfields in Connecticut, come home, we invested our money in baby calves. First truck we ever owned was a 1966 Ford flatbed, 12 foot long. Is anybody in here old enough to know about pulp wood? We used to go down the mountain and cut pulp wood, five foot long, and throw it on that truck after school. And, and during the summer, my dad wouldn't let me drive the truck loaded because he was scared. But we got brave, so we, we got a load early that morning. Came back, I brought the truck back and we loaded that evening. You know, we did everything we could. And still, you know, it's survive. But you get tired. Yeah. And especially when your government don't listen to you. I spent a night in jail when I marched with the black farmers in Vegas down Maryland. I was arrested. The FBI came in, they interrogated me. And they helped, they helped me overnight. That morning, when I got interrogated, they released me. I didn't get a felony, and that's when I got the invitation along to go to the White House and have dinner with the Secretary of Agriculture. I'm saying, come on, Virginia. Let's tighten up on this land, farmland preservation. If you're listening, farmland preservation is the key access, economic access, access to, for us to get land. Thank you. <laughs> Sir, I thank you for those comments and for your honesty and, and, and your voice represents the experiences of, of, of more people in this room. Um, uh, you highlight something important, the Farmland Preservation Program, which the Department of Agriculture um, has funding, match funding for localities. I have, have spoken extensively with, with Secretary Ring and uh, Commissioner Copenhaver about how to incentivize more land and preservation. And I hear you with the need for grants and funding to preserve land, but also to access land. And we have a, a, a thriving agri agribusiness um, industry here in Virginia. There are more farmers of color that need to be involved because there, there are things at your farm that I'm sure we want to come see and we'll pay you for. <clears throat> Thank you for this opportunity. Hope you can hear me through this mask up. <clears throat> my name is Renard Turner, and I farm in Louisa County, Virginia. The name of my farm is Vanguard Ranch. I've been entrenched in agriculture since my early teens in California, where I participated in Future Farmers of America, etc., etc. I served three terms as the president of the Virginia Association for Biological Farming. I also served under Secretary Vilsack and his Minority Farmer Advisory Council 
and at BSU and the College of Agriculture Minority Farm Advisory Council as well. I'm currently active in HEMP. I've met Secretary Raines before in her office in Richmond. I know Dr. Brona from years here. And I've met Abigail Spanberger, who's my seventh district congresswoman on a Zoom conference. So this is our first face-to-face -face and we'll do a lot more of this. I'm here because agriculture is the key to my liberation and the liberation of African-American people in this country. We often have these conversations about past misgivings, and I see this as an attempt to try to right some of those wrongs, but what's missing in this conversation is the impassion that brothers like this man just stood up and told you about what it really is to farm. So a little bit about me. My wife is my partner. We bought this land in Louisa County out of our pockets. I worked 25 years at UVA in the medical school, in the medical hospital side. We took our paychecks and paid for our farm that was owner finance. We paid it off. We did fine until we borrowed money from the FSA. As a result of our interaction with the FSA, which the only reason we did that is because we were committed to being farmers and to bringing, I should mention that we are sustainable and organic, fresh food to the African American population for a myriad of reasons. Lots of reasons we wanted to do this. It was a personal and a spiritual commitment. We borrowed the money, we got $200,000 which was the largest that an individual could get in Louisa County. Um, we were not able to make the payments on a regular basis because we had no customers, no consistent customer base, and none of these programs that allegedly are going to help BIPOC minority African American farmers were going to actually do that if you cannot guarantee a consistent customer base. That's what's missing in all these conversations. This is not based on a computer database module. I've been through that, I can do them all night as good as anybody. You can make it say whatever the hell you want. Without consistent customer base, these black farms are still not going to survive. So a bit about my FSA. When we went to speak to them, and I will say this, the regional office is Fredericksburg. The first person in charge, the last name was De Pascal. She was excellent. She was very good on her job. When she retired, God is my witness, she said to me, Mr. and Mrs. Senator, I hope things continue to work well for you, but things are going to change. She had extended opportunities to us. She was very good. The people who took over, not so much. I would have an appointment scheduled. I would drive from Louisa to Fredericksburg, and I would be made to wait for 45 minutes to an hour in an office that was no further than from here to that wall. They knew I was there. Long story short, we got a letter saying we had 100, no, 30 days to come up with $100,000 or be foreclosed upon. 30 days, $100,000, raise your hand if you can do that. That's what I thought. When I approached them about it, they said, well, it is what it is. We went through all of the legal negotiations that this country allows. We had an outside negotiator who came from North Carolina. She was an African-American female. When we finished with our regional hearing in the Fredericksburg office, the two men who were not black refused to sign off on the paperwork evaluating her interaction as a negotiator. Flat out refused. When we left, my wife was crying, and the negotiator said to us, I'm so sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Turner. They obviously did not come here to negotiate with you. I immediately drove to Charlottesville, employed an attorney, bankruptcy chapter 13, the best one I could find. Was not cheap, but he was damn good. And he sat us down and he said, here's what I can do for you. But you have to decide, do you want to keep your house or do you want to keep the farm? That's the options. That's not a database, this is real talk. My wife and I said, you know what? Is it worth it to keep fighting? Because at the end of the day, what nobody's gonna tell you about, these loans will not bring you customers. Will not bring you customers. America has a problem. It has since its inception. It is based on race, and with God as my witness, 
I have been to local stores in Charlottesville to sell first class, pristine, beyond organic produce, and my farm jacket and coat with my wife. After we called the store in advance, they wanted to meet us. When we presented as two blacks, they told us, we're so sorry, we have all the providers and producers we need for this season. Please call us again next year. A week later, I'm at a farm conference, and a white female farmer from my Sam County sits next to me at the bar while we're having a beer, and she says, guess where? I just landed this contract at the same store I was at three days before. You cannot legislate those types of changes. So don't for a minute think that by just taking away debt, which is a good thing, I would have been happy for you all to have taken mine away, but you're all late, okay? You're late, and I'm not the only one that you've been late for. You need to hear this. What about those farmers who already lost their land? What happens to us? You know, we, we need to have a real dialogue about this. There's more that have already lost than you're trying to help now. Real talk. 98% of the agricultural land in this country is owned by white people. They stole it from people of color. Real talk. You want to fix it? Go all the way back and get it right. Get it really right. We can't fix part of this without going deeper. 1.46% of all the farmers in America are black. 1.46. We own less land now than we did in 1935. Brookings Institute says that the average net income of an African-American family is projected to be zero in the year 2053. Zero. Now what part of that is progressive? We've got a lot of work to do. You can find me at vanguardranch.gmail.com. We've got a lot to say. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner, and I've known you for, for many years. I know the great products that come out of Vanguard Ranch. I know the struggles. And, and you're, you're right. We have a lot of work to do. And, and this debt relief is just the beginning. Um, it's the first step, and, and we fully acknowledge we have a lot of work to do. Um, and in addition, the market piece. You talk about markets. That, that's very important. Actually, there, uh, there is some additional money in the American Rescue Plan to focus on the support for market development. I know your point that you made about market development, but um, thank you very much for, for passionately and eloquently talking about those struggles over the years. And uh, we certainly hope to begin to move forward to rectify some of those things as we go forward. I appreciate it. And I think we're over time. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, and I want to thank you for the work, great work you all are doing. One of the things that I would like to see is if this administration, since we're talking about green energy, could work with black farmers to put solar farms on their property, because this would generate a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars an acre, and they wouldn't have to do anything. It would allow black families to maintain and to keep their land because of the income that will be generated. And uh, this is one of the options that I'd like to see us look at. One of the other things that I'd like to say is that uh, we talk about the economic loss, but we don't talk about the emotional loss of discrimination and how it breaks down the family. Uh, I have been a victim of this and it's caused me great problems, but uh, one of my neighbors, Mr. Cleveland Weldon, he was a veteran, served this country, got USDA loans, and they refused to make him his loans on time and to allow him to plant his crops. His fields would be this tall and weeds, and everybody would say that he was a bad person, but it was the bad people who was lending him his money. Mr. Weldon passed. Uh, this year and the grief and the pain because I saw a grown man sitting in his car crying because he could not get the money to plant his crops and, I, and you know like I said there's a breakdown in the family structure 
true story about me, I came to Virginia State. I graduated, uh, and I have classmates here that have verified this. I came to this campus four years, never spent a weekend, because I worked every weekend, because I had two brothers and sisters, and I mean, I had two sisters, and one of us would have to drop out. I had a feeder pig operation. I get up, I lived 105 miles from here. I get up, drive to Petersburg, unload my pigs, and come back for an 8 o'clock class. But I graduated with honors because I wanted to farm. Uh, well, one day I had some sick pigs, and what happened was I brought them back to campus. And college kids being kids, let my pigs out on campus. So I was out catching pigs, and a young lady came, helped me catch those pigs. I ended up marrying them. We went home, and we had six beautiful children. And we bought a farm, and that was great. But the story got bad. We ended up getting an FHA loan. And that loan and the discrimination destroyed my life and my marriage. So thank God that I have four children that are farmers. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I'd just like to say as a, a final comment, um, I, want, I want to thank you for those of you all who, who spoke up and talked about the pain, the personal pain, the financial pain, the loss that you have personally suffered, because these are the stories that we need to understand as we make decisions going forward and how important this work is going to do, how much work needs to be done at USDA, how committed we need to be. Uh, we will never heal all that has happened in the past, but we can make some steps to go forward. And, and I promise you that Secretary Vilsack, and I will be sure that we do so because your lives and livelihood depend on it. So thank you so much for a little bit of time. Um, I appreciate your comments and your questions, and um, please feel free to ensure you have resources going forward. Thank you, Virginia State, for letting me have some time here today, and thanks to the panel.